Okay, so we have been looking at randomized algorithms for optimization um, and we have been looking at population based methods. Uh, so let us take a little bit of a diversion here and uh, look at this area called emergent systems. This is also kind of motivated by what happens in nature because in nature you find that uh, complex systems emerge out of interaction of simple systems and there is a whole field of study which uh, is devoted to studying such systems and we kind of talk about the property of such systems which emerge from the behavior of simple elements. This area is also known as complex dynamical systems and uh, amongst other things they people look at things like chaos as part of this. But also uh, we want to see that how complex organisms can emerge out of interaction of simpler organi organisms. So the idea of emergent systems is that collections of simple entities organize themselves and a larger more sophisticated entity emerges out of this whole process. So it is a question of in some sense as far as we are concerned perception as to so we for example see our ourselves as one human body but if you look closely enough you will see that we are made up of many organs and those organs are in, in turn made up of smaller parts. So in some sense we are a colony of uh, uh, living cells which somehow you know uh, exist as a human being. So this is the idea which uh, has come out of th this notion of emergent systems and we can see and we will see uh, soon that we can think of an ant colony like a living organism which you know can go in search of food and uh, exist and survive very, very efficiently eventually. The idea of emergent systems is also kind of relevant to the human brain uh, and as we will quickly see the brain is made up of uh, billions of very simple computing elements called neurons and somehow we have this very complex uh, brain that we have and this has been a separate line of inquiry into intelligent systems that people say that maybe we can just mimic the way nature grows brains and how the nature in some sense trains brains and come up with systems which work like that and we shall have a very passing look at the area of neural networks which is motivated from that. You must have seen uh, sometime a flock of birds which is flying in synchrony and in fact their interactions are fairly complex because they sometimes have leaders who lead the flock and the others follow and then they keep changing the leaders and things like that. It is a bit like what sometimes teams in cycling competitions do uh, that somebody goes ahead and leads and the others follow and all this happens in nature quite a bit essentially. Uh, you must have seen termite mounds which are quite elaborate uh, or if you are familiar with the notion of the stock market. Now there are millions and millions of investors and traders who every day trade uh, in the stock market buying and selling shares and yet uh, somehow when you look at news and market commentary you kind of see people talking about the market as one entity which is a, in some sense a mind of its own. So people say that the market did not like this announcement by the government or the market is uh, happy with the GDP numbers and things like that. So it is as if there is a larger entity which is behaving in a very concerted fashion. Sand dunes are also made up of small particles but you know if you look at them they look so artistic that you might think that you know there is something behind the beautiful structures and hurricanes and cyclones which we also tend to think as single entities are in fact made up of uh, the very intricate thermodynamic interaction between you know uh, heat and motion. So an interesting thing to look at is uh, 
a cellular automator uh, which was devised by John Conway in 1970. Uh, and so, a cellular automator is basically an array of cells and time moves in discrete steps. So, there is time t0, time t1, time t2 and so on and each cell interacts locally with its surroundings. There is no global picture, each cell just looks at its surroundings and goes through a state transition uh, system. The state transition is described by the table here. As you can see that uh, if, if, a, if a cell, so, so each cell has 8 neighbors. as you can see here and it essentially its its fate depends on how many neighbors are alive at any given point. So, when you say alive uh, you can denote it by a value of 1 for example or you can color that particular cell in some color and if it is dead then you can denote it by 0 or color it in a different color or leave it blank or something like that. So, this table which uh, John Conway gave us describes the behavior of each individual cell as follows. So, in the first row we see that if a cell is alive and it has less than two neighbors which are alive then it dies essentially and you can think of the explanation as that it, it became lonely and it died essentially. The second row shows that if a cell was alive to start with and it has two or three neighbors which are also alive then it continues to stay alive and it is in a stable state of existence. The third row says that if a cell is alive and more than three of its neighbors are alive then it dies and you can think of the explanation as it has become overcrowded essentially. So, this is a case of a cell which was alive. If a cell has died it can be reselected and the rule that Conway gave us was that if exactly three neighbors are alive then a dead cell becomes alive. Now, with this very simple set of rules, so if you have a cellular automata which is uh, basically a collection of such cells, it is an array of cells and you initialize the population to some random values of being alive or dead and you just let it run or you just let it go and one finds that very complex patterns and stable patterns. Uh, emerge out of this and which sometimes people have you know kind of equated with things like life and so on. So, many stable and per persistent patterns emerge. Remember we had talked about persistent uh, when we had talked about uh, evolution and uh, we had said that uh, everything that persists persists and everything that does not does not essentially. Okay. So, idea can also be seen here. So, let us look at an example here uh, which I have taken from the Wikipedia page and what you are seeing on the left hand side is an animation which shows uh, how the cells are behaving. So, in this animation black means alive and white means dead and this particular combination has become very famous. It has been known as a glider gun uh, and it is as if the top part uh, is like a gun and it is kind of shooting bullets in one direction. Uh, if you were to you know try to implement this yourself and see then you would see that many many such interesting patterns occur and if you look at this particular pattern which is the which is the object which is moving from the top left to the top right it gives us an illusion of movement. So, actually what is happening is it is not as if there is some entity which is moving, it is just that the cells that that form the pattern keep changing the pattern. So, if you look at this pattern on, on, on the left hand side in this sequence, you can see that this cell will die out because it has only one neighbor, this cell will die out because it has only one neighbor and the other three cells will survive which you can see in the next stage here and a cell where I am putting a dot will come into being because it has sorry not this one a cell here 
will will come alive because it has exactly three neighbors that are alive likewise a cell here will come alive which is uh, uh, which which is the case because it has these three neighbors which are alive and so this this pattern transforms into this pattern and then if you study this you will see that this transforms into this and so on and so forth and we start up we end up with the same pattern but at a some distance away from the original and in that sense it gives us a sense of being an entity which is or a creature which is moving though in fact what's happening is that each cell is behaving in its own independent fashion uh, interacting with its local neighbors and you can say that much of the world actually could be like this essentially because if you apply the laws of physics uh, then you know every atom in our body has to behave those laws but somehow you know our, our all the atoms in our bodies they behave in concert and we emerge as conscious thinking creatures so an area which is kind of closely related to uh, such uh, emergent behavior is the area of chaos and the notion of fractals so fractals and you should look it look this up on the web are fascinating patterns that uh, kind of have this very significant property of being self similar and across different scales we'll see this idea in a moment essentially they are created by repeatedly applying some simple process over and over just like a cellular automata was doing uh, and driven by this recursion fractals are images of dynamic systems so you know we said that there is this whole field called complex dynamic systems and fractals are basically visual realizations of such systems so people have studied chaos and and people have kind of made observations that sometimes minor changes in some initial conditions can lead to major changes uh, uh, in a larger context you might have heard about the butterfly effect essentially which says that if a butterfly flaps its wings in one part of the world then maybe a storm or a typhoon would result in a different part of the world so this is kind of studied in this field of chaos and uh, it's also a property of emergent systems essentially so fractal patterns are very familiar to us because a lot of things in nature for example trees uh, rivers coastlines mountains they all exhibit this property of self similarity at different levels of scale so if you imagine a tree and you take you you look at the branch, one particular branch of a tree and think of that as a tree then you can see that it is in some sense self similar to the original tree and then you know you look at sub branches and so on so there is a notion of self similarity a very well known uh, pattern of self similarity was the triangle that we will see and if you see this triangle then what you can see is that we started off with a triangle and then we inserted a triangle inside this and then we inserted a triangle inside this and so on if we keep doing this then there is a self similarity self similar never ending pattern and this pattern has been known as the sierp sierpinski triangle this described in 1915 by sierpinski and you can see that there are certain structures in nature for example the snowflake which you can see uh, on the left can be seen to have come out of imposing uh, self similarity on this same notion of the sierpinski triangle so you start off with a triangle then you impose a second triangle on top of it so that's seen here and then you on every side you impose a triangle and you keep doing this process and eventually you get this very complex structure called the uh, which is looks like a snowflake or the triangle itself uh, the sierpinski triangle itself can be thought of like this so we kind of outline a particular part in this pattern and then we do that recursively in its sub parts essentially and we keep doing that and eventually we will get something 
which is an int another interesting pattern based on the Siopinski dynasty. So this 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 also shows that that complexity can emerge out of very simple rules, and it's a fascinating uh, subject in itself. So let's move on to our own brains, which uh, Christopher Koch, who works or work, works at the Allen Institute of Brain Science, Brain Science, has said that it's a our brain that is the most complex object in the known universe, essentially. And various people have you know tried to describe this in various ways. So this quote is from a New Scientist magazine from 2016. The brain is the most complex organ in the human body. It produces ev our every thought, action, memory, feeling, and experiences of the world. If you remember, Rene Descartes said, and this was a few hundred years ago, he said, I think, therefore I am. So we often identify ourselves as these thinking features that we are, and all this is possible because of this jelly-like mass of tissue weighing about 1.4 kilograms, and it contains a staggering number of neurons, close to 100 billion nerve cells or neurons. The complexity of connectivity between these cells is also, as new scientists say, mind-boggling. Each neuron can make contact with thousands or even tens of thousands of other neurons, essentially. And our brains, they keep forming new connections, millions of new connections every second of our lives, and the pattern and the strength of these connections is constantly changing, essentially. Okay, so again, the, the thesis is that each neuron, as we will see shortly, is a very simple entity, it is a very simple computing entity, but when you put millions of them together and connect them together and impose some kind of a structure on it, then it becomes a thinking brain of the kind that we have essentially. If you look at the neuron itself from a biological pers perspective, then you can see that uh, uh, it is a cell uh, which is uh, which has a cell body and uh, a soma and then there are these dendrites which are kind of feeding into this, feeding signals into the cell and this cell itself has an axon from where it sends out a signal as you can see from here and this axon spreads out and eventually sends a signal into uh, another cell through a connection called a synapse. So the, the activity here is a combination of electrical and chemical activity and essentially what happens is that when this cell has received a sufficient amount of input signals, it itself sends out a signal. So that is a very simple processing that it does, but you put millions and millions of them together uh, and you get the human brain essentially. So this is again just uh, a smaller version of the same picture. And as we, as I was just describing, the biological neuron uh, receives several inputs via its dendrites. So these are the inputs that we were talking about. And then at some point it decides that it needs to send out a signal. And it sends out a sing signal through its axon and which is in, in turn connected to many dendrites and via synopsis it sends the signal into other neurons. And the shaded portion on that we have seen here in the center of this cell is the soma or the nucleus of the cell. So this is a simple cell essentially. And again uh, a comment on the humongous size of our brains in terms of the number of cells that we have. This one is from the independent in an editorial which was studying the human brain. So we have something approaching 100 billion nerve cells or neurons in the human brain. And this number is more than the number of stars in the Milky Way. So you can imagine how much we have in our heads. Each of them as we have observed can connect to maybe 10,000 others totaling something like 100 trillion nerve connections all inside our head. And each neuron of a single human brain, if you were to lay them end to end, then they would go around the earth twice over essentially. So you can see that it is it's really the size, it is the number of neurons which is making a difference and uh, the neuron itself is a very simple element which uh, computer scientists have modeled as a uh, uh, simple computing element uh, 
which essentially defines a function uh, from in the inputs that it gets x1, x2 up to xn and it implements a function y is equal to some function of this input and typically the idea is to mimic the human uh, brain neuron and there is a kind of a threshold after which the, the output is generated and this function is very often a non-linear function and of the kind that we studied when we were looking at simulated annealing and uh, so the threshold is kind of de determined by the inputs which come in essentially. The first attempts at neural networks modeled f as a linear function, but it was shown pretty quickly that that is not going to be doing anything significant. So, this is a simple neuron and what the community of artificial neural networks studies is collections of such neurons. So, one such architecture of how do you connect these neurons is a feed forward network in which uh, in which uh, signal flows from left to right and the neural network or the artificial neural network it basically embodies or encapsulate a function where the output is a function of the input. So, as I said the leftmost layer is the input layer and this is where you sense the external uh, environment. The rightmost layer is the output layer which is where you denote the function that is computed of the input layer. So, a typical example would be that you show an image on the left hand side and on the right hand side it could show some label for example, saying it is a character H or a character B or there is a dog or whatever the case may be, but it is something which depends upon the input and the system has figured out how to label that thing. So, it was shown in 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 the 70s and the 80s that uh, what is critical to a neural network learning complex functions is that there should be a hidden layer and most of the time people experimentally try to figure out how many hidden layers are there and uh, or how many nodes in a hidden layer are there and only very recently in this century after hinton and others uh, showed that if you increase the number of layers uh, to more than 3, so in, to more than one hidden layer, then in practice the neural networks perform much better and you must be familiar with the term deep neural networks, which sometimes people associate with the term deep learning. But the basic idea is that it is a deep network in the sense that there are many, many layers, hidden layers and that has shown to be performed very well. So, how does, how do neural networks know how to classify uh, the image or whatever function they are learning? They do so through a process of what is called as training essentially. So, the ANN learns a function through a process of training in which large number of labeled patterns are shown as input and the network generates some output. This output may differ from what the label is. So, remember that there are label patterns. So, you show an image and you show what should be the class label and if the output generated by the neural network is at variance with the expected output, then an algorithm called back propagation algorithm which was devised in uh, around 1980 or so, it essentially propagates the error back into the network to tune the weights of the connections. We have looked at evolution, we have looked at neural networks. Uh, and various things. So, one researcher which put all these kind of things together was Carl Sims and he essentially looked at how one can evolve artificial creatures and his this research was published in the mid 90s and his idea was to combine neural networks uh, uh, which would be the computing which would be in, in sense the learn component of its creatures. Uh, along with this idea of uh, uh, genetic uh, algorithms, evolution and so on and he tried to evolve creatures which would do certain things essentially. So, this figure shows on the left hand side the genotype that he constructed which was directed graphs uh, 
and on the right hand side you see as uh, phenotype which is like body parts being put together according to various designs. So, remember we had said that the genotype is like a design of a being and the phenotype is the actual being and Carl Sims simulations actually worked on this notion. So, he ended up devising a lot of uh, evolved creatures and these are some of them. His goal was to to learn or to evolve systems which could do locomotion and if you watch some of the evidence which is available on the net. For example, if you go through any of these uh, um, links that I have put up here, uh, you can actually see how these uh, features evolve. So, maybe we can do a very quick uh, look at one video and just to see uh, what is happening here. So, here is a uh, evolved creatures by Carl Sims as you can see and these creatures were kind of designed to learn how to move in water. So, in some sense how to swim as you can as you can see that evolution has resulted in various designs. So, we do not have time to go through this uh, uh, complete video here, but I encourage you to look at some of the, the material which is available on the web. So, you can see interesting designs of locomotion arrived at through a process of evolution essentially. So, let us get back to our uh, this thing. Uh, so, so, this was a work by uh, Carl Sims and I would also encourage you to see look at this documentary called the secret life of chaos, which uh, is a fascinating documentary, uh, which starts off uh, with some work which Alan Turing had done and looked at this notion of chaos and eventually shows you the kind of creatures that Carl Sims had evolved. So, that kind of finishes our study of emergent systems and next we look at another example of a population based system. Uh, which is ant colonies and we will try to take some inspiration from ants and see how a social structure in which cooperation can result in the good for all can emerge out of combination of simple elements. Ants are simple creatures, but ant colonies can be quite complex. So, we will see that in the next lecture.